Have you ever wanted to play a difficulty level where your sh** gets rocked so hard that you start questioning your life choices? I genuinely think I can't do this. Well, The Evil Within has got you covered with its Akumu mode, as it's essentially a Victorian child simulator where if someone were to so much as cough on you, you die. Walk into a bear trap? You die. Take a foot to the ass? You die. Attempt to even slightly outsmart the game by stunning an enemy with a glass bottle? You die. Oh. In this difficulty, ammo is in short supply. Endgame enemies show up at the beginning of the game. Enemy placements are also different. Traps are more plentiful. And last but certainly not least, no matter what damage you take, you will die in one hit. I don't know what any of this shit is and I'm fucking scared. Despite the immeasurable odds stacked against me, I jumped right into this madness head first, expecting the absolute worst. And to be honest, chapter one was actually pretty easy. Since it's entirely a game of cat and mouse with not Salvador from RE4. There's really not much to say about this chapter, especially since I didn't die a single time here, but don't worry, it's a coming. Entering Chapter 2, we're transported to a wooded area and learn the basics of box combat, otherwise known as boxing, and also obtain a gun for our first encounter with an enemy, and yeah, my aim needs a little work, but I survived, and that's what matters. But when the game introduces stealth as an option, that's when things become a bit precarious. No f***ing shots. All right, first death. <laughs> okay. So they insta-kill you no matter what. That is what Akumu does. No matter what damage you take, you will die. This will be fun for you guys. Or for me too, you know? Maybe I'll just go through the rest of this game without dying. In fact, right now, I'm going to declare it right now. I will go through the rest of this game without dying. Wait, what? That is bullshit. Okay, here we go. Uh, what do we do from here? Once I stopped fooling around for content and decided to use 5% of my brain power, I managed to clear out all the enemies near the exit, allowing me to safely open the gate and access the nearby bridge. However, Sebastian's stamina problem had other plans. Why? 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 Get the f up! Get the f up! Go, 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 go! <laughs> we want these moments. Okay, that's all that matters then. You guys are having fun, then I'm having fun. But I am genuinely having fun right now. As you can see, I was feeling pretty high and mighty when progressing into chapter 3, having only died four times total in the previous chapter. And man, do I gotta say, that level of confidence was sorely misplaced. All right, chat. We saved. Let's do some content here. All right. We're gonna get this first try. This chapter primarily takes place in this large village filled with all sorts of fun activities for Sebastian to participate in. You've got hide and seek, playing tag with angry murderers, bear traps, a Rubik clone who loves to ruin all of your well thought out plans, and finally, not Salvador. It was this chapter where I started to really understand, oh yeah, Akumu don't play around. But after a lot, and I mean a lot of trial and error here, like a solid two hours worth, I somehow managed to finally take down not only the chainsaw dude, but also the entire village. <laughs> I mean, shit, I'd be tired too if I was getting fucked as hard as Sebastian has been. So now that I kind of have an idea of what I needed to improve, I went to the safe haven where I can give Sebastian electric shock therapy to upgrade how many bullets he can hold in his back pocket. Kind of wish I was kidding with that one. In all seriousness, my priority at this point of the run was to upgrade Sebastian's stamina, ammo stock, and agony bolts. Stamina is obvious. Dude can't run farther than a couple feet without acting like he's gonna black out. Ammo stock, also obvious. And agony bolts are because they have the ability of going into the files of the game and outright deleting the enemies if used in the right way. The only thing in chapter four that poses a threat to Sebastian's little brittle ass is this room that's ripped straight out of a Saw movie. You've got traps, dozens of haunted, and of course, a Ruvik clone. 
Good luck, have fun. Yeah, it's fun. That's what I'm about to have. Lots of fun. So with that all in mind, I pieced together a plan that was so smart that the game couldn't possibly win. So most of, the, most of them are gonna spawn here. So we're going to need a shock, shock one. We're also gonna have, we're gonna hotkey this over here. We'll throw that first, then we'll do an explosive one. Pretty sure a Ruvik spawns, so we're gonna have to flash him. And after spawning everyone, I set the plan in motion and... Damn it, okay, okay. That was a bad, that was a, that was pretty desperate. I didn't want to do that. Well, plans aren't really my strong suit anyway, so I tried improvising instead. Get the f up there. What the f are you stuck on? Oh my God, dude. Okay, all right. The only solution I could think of at this point was to use the traps against the haunted, and lo and behold, I was successful. Who would've thought, right? Not me. And then all that was left was to run away from the thing you'd find clogging your shower drain, and that's that for the chapter. Now, if chapter three and four really showed me how difficult encounters can be, then chapter five gave me a taste of how creative problem solving can ward away the potential BS this game throws at you. For example, when using the environment, I'm able to tell where invisible enemies are based on if they stepped in a puddle or in the process of knocking every single piece of furniture in the room. Another thing that was also helpful was baiting out a horde of enemies by this oil puddle and then igniting it as they got close. But none of these big brain plays can save you from the true horror of all in this game. Spider-Man. I mean Joseph. Get it? Because they're the same voice actor? Joseph is just about the most worthless AI partner in all of video games. Like, I'd literally rather have Ashley or Maria. Hi. Nope. Joseph. Joseph, she's right there. There we go. Dude would not shoot her. The first actual hard part that most people struggle on in this game is this large room where you get surrounded by a ton of haunted, all while babysitting Joseph. But I did it on the first try. Although Joseph really tried to spoil that at the end there. The other hard part of the chapter happens immediately after when you have to catch up to Joseph and Kidman. And my luck, didn't fully translate here like it did before. Why, you may ask? Go ahead and guess. Can you not? Why are you useless? Why the fuck are you useless, Joseph? It's okay though, I only reset a couple of times before I was successful, and all that was left for the chapter was to use some Drano on the hair plug, and after that, we were well on our way to the next chapter. So, what's the next chapter again? For those of you who haven't been graced by the amazing experience that is Akumu, Chapter 6 is basically a gauntlet of unrelenting, ball-stompingly hard fights, all back to back. So let's start with the first part, Ring Around the Rosie. This part requires you to survive against a horde of enemies in a tightly confined room while Spider-Man is jerking off a door for a few minutes. The best way i found to deal with this room is by training all the enemies in a circle, kind of akin to COD zombies, because if I didn't do that, the enemies would instead run a train on me. Oh god. Why? This is not how Call of Duty works. <laughs> oh, but it doesn't stop there, because if you manage to survive the top floor, you still have to do the same thing downstairs with even more enemies, and if you die, you gotta do it all over again. Oh my god, why? I'm so screwed because I don't have shock uh, bolts. Also, there are times where Joseph all of a sudden thinks he's the main character in all of this. Joseph, you miss that? He's right in front of you. Joseph, 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 please go work on the fucking door. You are doing too much, sweetie. But after a total of 27 deaths spent in these two rooms, I barely made it out. Joseph, please open the door, open the door. Go, go, go. Oh my God, finally. That was the easy part. 
Now on to the second part of the chapter, Choke City. Yes, I, I realize I'm very bad at naming things. In this section, you have to take down four Gatling Javelin Box dudes and then finally another phony Salvador. Though that's kind of an oversimplification as there's also an infinite spawn of enemies that will try to kill you as you're doing all of this. No, 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 no! However, you can make this section easier if you go off to the right side first and kill everyone there as the encounter technically hasn't started yet, which allows you to go loot the whole place, giving you a good boost for your resources. And because of this helpful head start, I actually beat this section with only a total of three deaths. Immediately after beating that comes the third part, Big Boned. I think we could admit I'm getting a little better at this naming thing. Here you have to protect Joseph from an onslaught of Haunted as he's dicking around with yet another normal ass everyday object, a switch. But it's a good thing that Sebastian is apparently built as wide as Adam Driver as you can just stand here and body block the Haunted, allowing you to do this part without spending any ammo. And now it's time for the fourth part of the chapter. Two men, one Sebastian. This part has you fighting two giant bullet sponges while also being occasionally attacked by other enemies. An easy way to deal with these guys is to hide in this little crawl space and then come out and give them some back shots. But we all know what happens whenever I'm doing something easy, right? Okay, but once I was done fooling around, I finally laid rest to these two goobers, which brings us to the final part of the chapter. It don't bite. This fight with Cujo is actually pretty brutal for not only the fact that he has the zoomies, but also for the bear traps strewn all throughout the area. There's a fucking bear trap there, are you kidding me? Why is there a bear trap there? But just like every other part of this chapter, except for the beginning, I actually ended up beating this section with minimal deaths, all thanks to the excess shock and explosive bolts that I had. And with that brings us to the end of chapter six. With the biggest difficulty spike in the game done with, probably, it was time to get a break with chapter 7, which just so happens to be one of the easier chapters in the game. Although I'll admit, it made it harder to focus when Snam raided me immediately after his big alien isolation nightmare permadeath dub. Don't grab me, don't grab me. Don't grab, okay, cool. No, it's cool. No, it's cool, I didn't, you know, it's fine. I wanted to restart. <laughs> what the fuck is this checkpoint? Are you kidding me? That's ridiculous. What the fuck? Excuse me? Thank you, Snam. And also, congratulations again, dude. At the end of this chapter, we're introduced to the Keeper, who is way faster than you'd think for a guy his size. Oh, what the fuck? But like most bosses up to this point, all I did here was play it pretty safe and was able to take him out without any casualties and thus ending another chapter. As we proceed deeper into the Akumu experience, it seems as though the difficulty is all downhill from now as chapter eight is the easiest chapter in the game. And honestly, like chapter one, there's not much to be said about this chapter other than the physics in this game fucking suck. Oh fuck. <laughs> but beyond that, chapter 8 was an easy clap. Now chapter 9 is probably one of the coolest chapters in the game, as you have an entire manner to yourself to discover with many secrets to find, but there's one tiny thing that stops the part from being fun. One scabby murder nerd named Ruvik. Fuck! <laughs> Scattered throughout the manor, there are three puzzles that you must find and solve, and I definitely can't show them on YouTube. But in between the puzzles are some resources that you can loot, which have the potential to lead to some more fun experiences. Oh my god, no! <laughs> you didn't see that. That didn't happen. I didn't miss three times. It's not real. That was doctored footage. Oh, and as if the game couldn't get any harder, um, enemies can now use guns. Oh, fuck. Why did my dude pull out a Glock on me? He didn't need to do all that. The last bit of the chapter is kind of a small horde fight that's pretty easy for as long as you spam shock bolts. And once I stopped choking, I could then end yet another chapter. 
Chapter 10 is when the game thinks it's f***ing funny because of the stuff it throws at you. And to its credit, it kind of is. Okay, all right. <laughs> at the beginning of the chapter, you're in a big, wide room that has a comically large spinning blade as you just saw. And while it is intimidating at first, it's really the surplus of gun-wielding enemies that'll ultimately be your downfall. No! No! <laughs> Fuck! What comes after the spinning blade room is a labyrinth of many enemies and various traps, but to be honest, the only thing that gave me trouble here is an encounter that is equivalent to the kid on the playground who changed the rules as they went along. What? You're just gonna walk that off? Ah, oh, you just hit me with a glass. I'm good. What are you, a f***ing pachycephalosaurus? Fuck. Oh no, there's two of them. All right, fucking Tom Brady over here, throwing around corners. Yeah, the big guy didn't show up last time, but this time he was like, hey, I've come to fuck you up. Fuck you, bitch. That's right, bitch. Nope. Where did he come from? Now there's a third guy. I mean, beyond that though, I didn't really struggle for the rest of the chapter. Okay, well, I just lied to you. I don't know why I did that. Let's talk about Laura. I hate this Australian-sized spider. The first part of our boss fight is like a pseudo-chase scene, and just like the previous fights with her, you gotta set her on fire and keep going. The real fight begins in these two rooms, and what makes this fight difficult is the fact that she's fast as hell, but also there are f***ing bear traps in both rooms. Although it took a while, I kept bashing my head against the wall until I finally had a breakthrough. Okay. <sighs> and after Laura, there's another boss fight. Well, I kind of had the necessary resources to take him out with minimal deaths, so with that, Chapter 10 is finally over with. So remember Chapter 6, yeah? Well, take all of what happened in that chapter and dial it up to 11 and you get this chapter. See what I did there? Now it's my understanding that what a lot of people struggle with is the garage part. And yeah, I can definitely see that being the case. No, it didn't go off for you? But it, it froze him at the top? Bro, hell no. But I'm pretty confident that I got lucky with this part, as I died only a handful of times. But what made up for it all was my experience with the gondola. Yeah, um... Shit. Okay, we are in a quite a pickle right now. Because of my carefree approach with my ammo and resources during the garage part, I inadvertently shot myself in the foot, as I had no ammo to deal with the gondola part. Meaning, I had to play nearly perfect here. Land the shot, land the shot. Or don't. <sighs> Just kill me. Just kill me. That, most of those, okay. Not most of those. Some of those aren't my fault. Some of those are not my fault. Come on. The reticle's on them, and then the bullet goes like, just like I do want it, and the bullet just curves out of my barrel and goes a 90 degree to the left. In fact, I was so low on ammo to the point where I had to resort to using all the magnum bullets I have been saving up throughout the whole game here. Every time you shot a, a magnum, I yell, ouch. <laughs> In failed attempt after failed attempt, I was convinced that I was soft locked here. I'm really screwed, honestly. I think my save is f I have to probably restart or something. I genuinely think I can't do this. And then, out of nowhere, everything clicked, and I beat the gondola section unceremoniously. There we go. I'm left with one magnum bullet. It's enough to end it all after this. But worry not, Twitch chat. Chapter 11 wasn't done having its way with me just yet. 
Oh, nice. Oh, okay. Let me guess, it's gonna kill me if I hit it too many times? Yep. And after lots of trolling and suffering, Chapter 11 is finally laid to rest. Chapter 12 kind of serves as like a cooldown chapter after the absolute mental destruction that Chapter 11 was. The boss for this chapter is pretty easy when you know how to dodge the attacks. That hit me? What is that hitbox? The holdout section that follows is also extremely easy since you can sit in this one spot and not get hit by anything. It's really just this last bit that can be tricky on the highway. This section requires you to collect a med kit from an ambulance because guess who got shot? That's right, you guessed it. Sasuke Uchiha. Yep, he voiced him too. To make this section a breeze, I try to bait out groups of enemies towards red barrels and set them ablaze, which saves me ammo. And once you have the med kit, there's a neat little strategy you can do here that skips having to even get on the turret. And you can just do that, and you can skip the whole thing. And that's it. That is chapter 12. You don't even have to get on the machine gun. The more you know. And that's another chapter down. Chapter 13 begins in a stealth section with new acid type traps that stop you from accessing certain areas, requiring you to find an alternative path. And this would be fun if it wasn't for the fucking Rubik clone barging into every room. I'm dead. Why does he walk all the way at the end of the hallway? <sighs> that was on me. That was on me. This stealth section isn't hard. I just kept dying because I wanted to make sure I had a perfect run so that I could look cool for you guys. But not too long after that section is this inconspicuous hallway with a dude who has two bright red lights on each cheek, and I couldn't help but be tantalized by what the light had in store for me. Oh shit! Okay, that's... not the way to do it. At the end of the chapter is a fight with another keeper inside of a very confined meat locker, and in my head, I for some reason thought this was a timed fight, so I spammed a bunch of shock bolts to prevent him from moving. Little did I know, you just had to kill him three times. Meaning, I wasted all of those. So... That's great. And with the keeper defeated, chapter 13 is now complete. This first part of chapter 14 is this large stealth sequence with a variety of different enemy types like invisible enemies, Americans, and Ruvik clones. Oh my. But miraculously, I managed to do it all in one try. Not in any way stealthy, but I made it. Realizing that I'm just another chapter away from the trophy, I was keen on seeing if I could beat Akumu in under 200 deaths. So in most cases, I opted to run past enemies to save resources, and also to, you know, prevent the chance of dying. I can run in this, right? Yeah, I can. The game knew. The game knew exactly what I was going to do. The final boss for the chapter is kind of a pushover if you have a bunch of magnum ammo like I did at this point, so he kind of got melted. Is that it? Wow, that was really easy. And with that, my fellow Balderlonians, brings us to the dawn of the final chapter. Chapter 15 really just boils down to a bunch of fights back to back that fully utilize everything you've learned about Akumu up to this point. And arriving in this chapter at 199 deaths meant that if I wanted to beat Akumu in under 200 deaths, I'd have to do this entire chapter without getting hit. So, did I end up pulling it off? Okay, this did not go how I wanted it to go. So we're gonna do this a little differently. <laughs> yeah, fuck no. But honestly, it only took a few attempts for me to really understand what I needed to do here before I was finally successful. 
There we go. I had to punch him to kill him. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. I hate everything. <laughs> I'm sorry. The second to last encounter for this chapter is the double keeper fight. As we know already, these guys are bullet sponges, and so I tried throwing all I had at them, and I got pretty close, but not close enough to beating them. With that in mind, I had to come up with a new plan, and oh boy, was this one absolutely genius. You know what? I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it right now. Oh! This is the run. <laughs> this is the run. <laughs> I'm gonna do it again. Push out, I'm so confident, I'm gonna do it again. I will get both. I'm going to get both. Okay, that was a little fast. All right, that was a little fucked up. They didn't need to do that to me. Nice. Nice. I'm literally a god. Now with my newly acquired supplies, I made a metric ass load of explosive bolts and kind of went to town on these dudes. And there you go. That is how you do it like a professional. All that was standing between me and the Akumu trophy was the final boss fight. And so I made one last save and went to go finally put this nightmare to rest. There we go! Ruvik. Eat my whole asshole. Forever! Nice. 218, I was off by 10. All right, let me fix that. With 218 deaths in total, I'm inclined to think that this trophy's difficulty is an eight out of 10 for the many stupid but funny ass ways you can die in this mode, but also for the amount of creative solutions that can be applied for many situations throughout the game. As an added note, I went into this Akumu playthrough absolutely hating the evil within, but coming out of the other side of Akumu, I have a newfound appreciation for this game because strangely, I had a lot of fun on this difficulty. So I implore that if you're even slightly interested in challenging yourself with this game, please give Akumu a shot. You'd be surprised how much fun could be had. If you enjoy content like this and would like to see more, consider subscribing. And if you want to witness these challenges live, go ahead and follow me over at my Twitch channel. It's the same name over there. If you made it to the end of the video, then I think you're a legend and that someone should write a story about you. Thanks for watching.